Welcome to Class. All right, nice. We are recording. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Um, so we've had like basically six solid months now. I mean, I want to say we started. I think in February we started with our first entrepreneurial folks that were uh, starting new ventures in AI and we really wanted to highlight that because we've been doing Accelerate and we knew we were doing Accelerate and um, you know Accelerate is our accelerator, why Accelerate? And we started in March and have been going and we're going until uh, the what mid or late August. So. It's been a six month program for us and um, it's been really fun because every week we've, we, we have more speakers, we have sessions. Part of Accelerate was, you know, connecting everybody that's in the program. So shout out to Marilena, who I'm gonna introduce in a moment. She's one of our founders uh, at Accelerate. And so the idea was, okay, let's get all these like different leaders, different subject matter experts, different people that could, um, you know, provide resources to anybody that's working in AI or wants to work in AI, wants to be an AI entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, let's give these these women uh, resources to start their ventures and get their feet wet. Um, so it's been it's been really tremendous. You know, we've been um, because of that theme, we've been looking to highlight uh, women that are already entrepreneurs so that they can inspire those that are in the program, uh, but also the, so that we could have kind of a common thread that's tying all of the events together. Um, yeah. Before we started with this kind of, um, you know, cadence of, okay, bi-monthly and focus on entrepreneurs, we had a lot of different people. You know, we had people that worked in corporate, we had people that worked at startups, we had people that were academics, um, and we are gonna be continuing to do that. Uh, we just wanted to kind of bolster the, the entrepreneurs in the spirit of why Accelerate. Um, so, Basically, what's coming up is we're going to start doing monthlies again, um, and we're going to start basically, uh, you know, changing kind of how we were doing things and, and going back to that traditional model of like getting a few different kinds of representation, uh, people that are working in, in different, uh, you know, different arenas, uh, but still working in AI. So that's what you have to look forward to starting September. Um, I will be traveling. Uh, I know a lot of people at Y are going to be traveling. So we're taking August off in the in the European spirit of taking August off overall. Uh, uh, Women in AI started in, in Paris and France. So um, I just think that's very French of us. You know, we're like, August is for fun. Uh, so um, yeah, so we're taking that month off and um, so let's get started. I'm gonna introduce the speakers. Um, I'm gonna have them basically give us uh, their spiel and tell us uh, more about themselves, obviously when they start. Um, but I just wanted uh, to give a quick shout out to the speakers before we go into that. Um, so uh, yeah, so Kenji is founder, co-founder of East East Meet West, which is an Asian East Meet East. I'm sorry. Right. Oh, East Meet <laughs> East. I'm sorry, Kenji. Um, I'm trying to read and also think at the same time. I clearly cannot do both. Um, Don't so, worry. Uh, so East Meet East is an Asian dating app. Um, and what I like actually love about the two speakers we have is uh, Marlena, who's our other speaker, who's a, an education tech uh, entrepreneur, uh, actually uses East Meet East. Uh, and, I, and that was totally a coincidence. Uh -huh. Uh, that we actually discovered today. Um, so that's really funny. And I think uh, generally the the theme of today's event is algorithmic algorithmic matching. So uh, we're going to be talking about, um, you know, entrepreneurship and their journeys and all that fun stuff we normally talk about uh, or touch on a little bit. Uh, but uh, what I thought was really nice about this is ultimately we're talking about algorithmic matching. We're talking about, you know, what are the challenges and, and the benefits that come from enabling AI in this capacity? Because, um, you know, ultimately, whether you're looking for uh, peers or 
or schools or you know lovers and life partners uh you know the 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 process of matching you is is actually very similar uh, so that's going to be the fun uh, part about our talk today is to understand what are the similarities and what are the differences uh, in terms of algorithmic matching um, in these two case studies, uh, use cases rather, uh, that we're going to be looking at. Um, so I don't want to talk anymore. I think I already took several minutes here, uh, more minutes than I expected to take. Uh, so Kenji, I would love for you to introduce yourself. We're going to start with you. Kenji's in Portugal. So I want her to get her segment done so she's not like falling asleep on us. Uh, my, my pronoun is they, so you can use they. <laughs> no worries, no worries, no worries. I, I'm not a, I'm not too like, you know, uh fixated on that but just just to tell you yeah i'm a i'm kenji i'm the co-founder of east meet east which is the number one asian dating app and now we have more than a million members i'm a, you know I, I started there uh when the members were less than you know 100 people and i was responsible for growing the business you know i mostly do uh, growth marketing in terms of product as well as like pure marketing stuff. So yeah, and now I'm doing mostly a uh, growth, uh, growth uh, advisor role for another company. I am a growth advisor for Aware Health, which is a mental health uh, app uh, for uh, professionals. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm engaged, uh, engaged in a, a, their largest marketing campaign now. So I, that keeps me busy now. Yeah, and I'm taking on a few other, yeah, growth marketing roles. So if you have any questions on, you know, growth marketing and all, I'll be more than happy to talk to you too. Anyways, yeah, I, just my background, I, you know, I'm half Thai, half Japanese. I grew up in Tokyo, you know, you know, uh, and then I came to the States. Uh, my first job was at Goldman Sachs as an investment banker, and then I became a lawyer, and then I dived into uh, the startup world. So that's about it. Yeah. I didn't realize you also became a lawyer. How do you have the time for all of this, Kenji? Oh, I was a nerd. I was just studying. <laughs> oh, okay, but still. <laughs> um, and you had a quote, I think. Mm -hmm. You want to go into the quote, or should I just start with? I think I should start with a um, question to you. Sure. So, so you. Imagine you have a dating app. This is not a trick question. I sincerely want to know your answer. So imagine you have a dating app, right? And you want to make this app successful. How would you tell your AI to optimize for in order for you to have a successful app? Yeah. Tell me. It's not a trick question. Me, me specifically, or the audience? Is this an audience participation question? Uh, after you, I'll ask two more audience. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take a stab at it. I would say you ask the AI to optimize for uh, people within a certain age range. And what's your, like, um, how would you, how would you measure success? So like, when they have for example like when they have certain kind of uh interaction mm -hmm. then you would define a success and you will go in that direction like how would you define that like apart from like active users like daily active users it's more like matching right it's like how would you like if this event happens mm -hmm. uh i would define this as a successful business and i will kind of pursue in that direction so you will tell ai to find more of those events happening yeah daily active user like a login event is one thing mm -hmm. but this is a dating app be mindful what you know what is the event that we you'll be looking at and telling the ai to pursue in a dating app like they create a profile and they write out right Okay. But that's not matching yet. Mm -hmm. What what is the definition for dating app? Like what is the success? Like yeah. But they get matched with the first person. Okay. Yeah, that's that's great too. Yeah, right. So shall we ask the audience? Someone yeah. says a date or a second date. 
That's pretty good. That's pretty good, isn't it? Like people go on dating app to get a date. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Vuba, you have um, Malena? Pop quiz. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyone else? No? Vuba, come on. <laughs> it's not a quiz because there's no answer. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, if a second date is uh, possible, then that can be a success, not the first one. Yeah. Oh, but how you? Okay. Suparna says taking mm -mm. more than the assigned date time, like if the date goes over. Mm -mm. Right? That's yeah. what you're but how would you tell your AI? It doesn't happen on your app. How, you, how would you tell your AI to like optimize for that event? Because it doesn't the date doesn't take place on an app no so that's that's very difficult that's what that i wanted to point out it's so difficult because and then time on the app too right if someone's logging in several times mm. a day or whatever it is you know yeah but if you log in but you might not find a date that's a disappointment isn't it mm -hmm. so yeah but it's these are the things filtering uh malena is saying filtering Yep, but you know, there's no answer, seriously. Uh, because as a company, you want to make money too, right? So maybe you will optimize for, uh, what is it, events that lead to making money. That's also one thing. And also like people wanna see certain things. They wanna see pretty people maybe. Do you feed them with what they want to see? Or do you, have other ways to show like a cards or you know profiles you know this is this is very difficult because like you said uh, it is probably right that you know if you can track uh, the the second date or the dating going over the assigned time that's probably a good event to optimize for but that doesn't happen within the app you know and if they're spending too much time on the app, they are not getting a soulmate, no? So is that a good measure for a success? Probably not, but what is like, what is a good time to be on the app, right? So these things, I just wanted to illustrate to you that it's not obvious, like using AI for a uh, dating app, because AI is not going to figure out what to optimize for. This is human who has to tell the AI mm -hmm. what to optimize for. And it, it's not very clear. And I wonder like how this is for uh, e-commerce, right? Right. I don't know whether, you know, like how, how they are doing it. But from the dating perspective, it's a problem. Because if I, you feed them with what they want to see, they will, like, for example, like in a heterosexual relationship uh, or like in a, in a dynamics, right? Uh, guys, you know, statistically speaking, guys tend to focus on the outlook, you know, uh, the looks of a uh, female member. Mm -hmm. So if you feed them with like the good looking female profiles, um, they might, uh, they might like it, but are they gonna get a match and find a soulmate? Probably not, because if you are not, you know, it's like, they need to like you too. Mm -hmm. And if you, right, go ahead. Yeah, well, I wanna make it interactive. Our conversation about this, you know, mm. I mean, I think it was months ago at this point. Uh, yeah. Because we were talking when we met, when we met in person and we were saying like, um, an attractive woman might have lots of messages and then she might stop using the app because it's too much, you know, and an attractive yeah. man, uh, you know, it, it seems almost counterintuitive because like, if you only match the attractive women with the, uh, with the attractive men, well, what do you do with everybody else? And how do you rate that? And who's right. more attractive, you know? And then the other problem is, of course, you touched on this. If you help these people find partners, they are no longer active users. So it's almost like a defeating thing being on a dating app, right? Because success, the success of your your you know what your app is intending to do, means that you're going to lose users. 
<laughs> exactly, exactly. But you know what? Uh, I I am not in that in that case. We like people to talk good about our app because word of mouth is very important for dating app, right? So, you know, I'm okay if they leave like in three days, I'm okay. But that's probably not the case. And I don't want them to have that expectation because this is hard work, you know? I need to keep on reminding them it's a hard work. And, you know, this illustrates that you can't just show them what they want, right? You can't just show them what they want because that may not lead to their success. Thus, it's not our success, right? Because we want them to be successful in order for them to start, uh, you know, uh, spreading good words about us. Uh, someone is saying something, Eileen, what is she saying? Yeah. Um, so when creating mm. a model for matching, what data do you start with? So- What is the training data process there like? Because obviously, mm you've got the app, you need to get some users to get some training data, right? And then mm. as you get more and more users, it gets better and better and you, you know, you learn what to optimize for better. So uh, for those that are creating, you know, AI companies, uh, maybe similar companies. Um, yeah, what did that process look like from the beginning as far as getting enough training data, getting a good enough model and then iterating from there? So it's never entirely like machines. It's heavily manual. Uh, we found out that it's really hard to just li leave it because, you know, success cannot be defined easily. You need to find that first within the app and it's quite multi-dimensional. Like for our app, it's very multi-dimensional because we have different ethnicities. And for example, we have also different immigration status. So they could have been born in the US, you know, or they could have immigrated into US you know, when they're adult. And they have different ideas about how the relationship is. So it, the, it's so different. The behaviors are so different. So we have to segment and then like build a different uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, model for uh, those segments. So, you know, it, you, I just wanted to illustrate to you that it's very human, like, you know, human elements still count. And that brings me to the next topic, like uh, I wanted to talk to you about is, uh, you know, like, uh, have you heard of this OkCupid okay blog about, you know, what ethnicities are most popular and what ethnicities and, you know, an underdog and all that stuff? I've been thinking, yeah, have you? Well, Ali? yes. Mm. Uh, and I used, to, I used to read it all the time. Um, mm. And I used to think about it because they would come up with certain conclusions based on their data. Mm. But for instance, I have a black friend and, mm. and, and she's like my best friend. Like she's, uh, you know, very close to me. And when we were like, she brought up being down about dating, feeling like, well, she was, she said something to the vein of, well, I'm the least desirable demographic because she's a black woman. And based mm -hmm. on their data, black women were seen as the least desirable. Right. And here's exactly the societal concern with something like this, because yes, we see things like in the image of, you know, the AI is mirroring nature to a degree. Right. But it's really just mirroring their their data, like their sample. So of their sample, maybe what they saw was because they had an abundance of white men, they had an abundance of white women, but then the other races, you know, there were there were less of them. And so they concluded right. okay, black women are our least desirable demographic. And so, Asian men are least desirable. And Asian men, yeah, right, of the two genders. Yeah. Well, there are many genders, yeah. but yes. Uh, yeah. They positioned yeah. at the time, yes. And um, yeah. so this was the issue that I had with that blog is, here you have a skewed sense of reality based on again their sample and but what it's doing is it's creating this concept that now a real person is taking and that is skewing their perception of how attractive they are right i uh, yeah i think this is a very good point this is like exactly what i want to talk talk to you about and the audience and marlena just made a good point about like bts which is a korean boy band 
uh, you know, changing it. Mm -hmm. So I think this, this all point to what I wanted to talk to you about. Again, there's no answer, but I wanted to bring to attention because it actually, I feel like it's reinforcing like your preferences, like your, your preferences is not inherent, you know, it's not innate, it's socially formed, right? So in this sense, if you keep on saying what the machine thinks you like, and then it gets to the extreme, basically, it's like watching a, um, like a dangerous porn, right? Initially, you are kind of slightly interested in like this topic, but you get into like, the more you watch, you get quite fixated on this idea and you get deeper and deeper into that. So I feel like that, you know, it's, it's, um, it seems like a reality and you're just looking at the number, but it could be forming people's preference as well. Because, you know, as, as Malena and you pointed out, um, you know, and uh, some other person concurred, it's socially, I think there's a social element, you know, it's, it's easy to dismiss that, oh, you're, you know, I'm just not interested. But, you know, do we have responsibility mm -hmm. to expose people to different things? Because, you, you know, you've never tried Thai food, you don't know, you know, like, and like, it's like, if you keep on showing only certain type of burger, Mm -hmm. right you're not gonna you're not even gonna think right. of trying it out right so how do you know and i bet i bet the thing that's really complicated with regard to dating matching is um you know navigating people's preferences because like for example when there are explicit preferences when you know you're a cis uh lesbian right mm. what is it you can be a cis lesbian yes you can be a cis lesbian Okay, yeah. so if you're a, a, a let's say a female identifying naturally born, so that's what I mean by cis, mm. lesbian, right? So you're a woman that likes other women. Mm. Uh, you understand the sexual preference and you understand gender identity too. So mm. both mm. those things are explicit. Um, but then you have you know kind of a mixed gamut of uh, people that identify as hetero, but maybe they have certain other sexual preferences that they don't know about yet or maybe those right. sexual preferences they have as to your point are um you know social constructs and maybe they think they're not into trans people but maybe that's only because they've never met a trans person or they've not haven't been on a date with a trans person right so it's really like a lack of exposure uh but right. then they say oh well i don't want to see people like that because they're pretty sure that they don't like that mm. um and then in 10 years as the culture changes i i would imagine those norms would start to change and those preferences would start to change mm. so i think would ai salt reinforce that you know, like would that solve it? No, I don't think so, unless there's human intervention, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to like illustrate that too. It's that it's um it's not obvious, you know. Uh it's it's um it's quite multidimensional and what AI can do can be uh may not be beneficial to the society or for the person in the long term, because you will never discover the thing you might have liked. Right. Right. So the question, you know, from a societal perspective, at what point does AI then get interrupted? I mean, as you're saying, there's already a manual mm -hmm. inputs, but there's manual inputs based on, you know, I'm sure you operate kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, conservatively, right? Like you don't want to make huge risks because, right. you know, they might not like what they see. So I'm sure that there's some decision making that's happening that's relatively safe where there are manual inputs. And if there are no manual inputs, then all it's going to do is just like kind of amplify this bias that already exists in society. So that puts you in a really yeah. difficult position as a, as a leader, you know, as a thought leader. Exactly. And what is it? Uh, you have a duty to maximize your profit uh, to your investors too, right? So you can be doing things. But, you know, like in long term, I, I think it's it's good to have a uh mix like short term and long term benefits to the members you know uh it is you know to to cultivate their preferences might increase their chance of matching right because if you 
if you are uh, a certain type of person and you think you only like this kind of person, it's like if you are a Chinese man who immigrated into the U.S. Uh, at the age of 24 and you feel like, oh, I can only meet a Chinese woman who has exactly the same background and live in the same city and it can be more than five miles away. You know, this is a very narrow filter, no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so being, being able to open their eyes can be beneficial. You know, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been too successful. I, I wouldn't say like I've been completely successful in achieving that, so I might not be able to add a lot uh here but i i think it's something we people should start thinking about that well, you know it, it depends on how you measure success because i would say a million users you're already super yeah. successful you know you have an ai product an ai enabled dating app and a million people are using it so to me that is success um and you're and you're talking about it on a regular basis which is also success you know so uh so thank you for being one of one of the voices no no here, honestly um uh okay so let's go a little bit into the entrepreneurial side of this uh because i would love to get some just a little context for people you know what what made you want to pursue something like this because you know there's you already had kind of all these skills, you know, so so why this? What really got you jazzed about this? So I'm generally excited to try out new things. Uh, so that's one thing that uh, I already had. And I felt like I already experienced the corporate world because I've done the finance side and I've done the, uh, you know, legal side. And, you know, to be honest, I had a, you know, safeguard because I'm a lawyer and I had, because I, I became an entrepreneur only at the age of 35 or so, right? So, you know, I'm much older than I look. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so I kind of had a safeguard. Uh, so in that sense, I'm not as brave as some of you. Yeah, but I felt like you only live once and I, I kind of knew on the back, you know, I, I kind of knew already that I'll be good at it because uh, I always think of how to market products. And, you know, I, I've always been thinking about that, you know? So I think one way to look at it is like, if you have that pers personality, you know, uh, of like, do you keep, you know, do you keep on thinking like, why, why do these products sell, mm -hmm. you know? that that might be a there might be a personality fit for you if you feel that way yeah yeah mm. uh, we do have some comments uh how wonderful youthful plus uh looks plus wisdom uh, and, uh. Someone, <laughs> and someone made a comment about uh collaborative filtering helping versus content-based filtering um mm. i don't know if do you want to get into the weeds like that? We don't have too too much time, but if you oh, I think I need that person to explain more so I can answer, you know, like uh, you know, more like accurately because yeah. I don't really understand uh, exactly what they're asking. Yeah, this. Um, um, I'm, I'm well, sorry about that. I was just referring to the earlier discussion about you know how do we hmm. match, and then what happens if you're you know always sticking to the same profile? We'll never Mm. So if it's anything that's kind of unusual and I was just uh, wondering if you know collaborative versus content-based filtering and mm. um, but yeah if you're not getting in the weeds that's perfectly fine I just started to kind of tussle with that while designing my model right now and so that's where my head is at so oh okay outside of the scope but you know I, I I think I totally think the traditional like filtering has its limits and it actually can harm people. So like a creative way of thinking uh, how to filter uh, profiles uh, would totally be uh, uh, a good idea. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. That's helpful because matching is active in, in so many of these AI apps and, and I'm sure a lot of the apps that are gonna come out of uh, Y Accelerate. So that, that is, um, that is uh, good, uh, good feedback. Um, and then I know we touched on this a little bit, um, 
but what advice do you have for these budding entrepreneurs and, and future leaders, you know, because I, I mean, I see you as a leader, uh, not just, um, you know, right now with what you're doing, but you're a leader because you have all this multi uh, cross disciplinary kind of skill set that you're applying right now in this focused way um, but but that takes a lot you know first of all that takes a lot of time you know you, you you spend a lot of time like getting those degrees and doing this other work that you were doing that you're now applying right, right. Way. uh so to me you know you're you're really an exemplary uh leader because you're taking this wealth of experience and really focusing it um so yeah what what advice do you have for others that want to kind of follow uh you know in your footsteps yeah, uh, you know, you made it sound like I've done a lot, but I just wanted to, my advice is very uh, simple, is uh, set a deadline uh, because you don't want to keep on doing things that, uh, you know, you believe in. Yes, it's good to believe in it, but you have to listen to people, you know, like you have to listen to the market. And uh, I would recommend people to test the market as soon as possible. Um, you can do like a micro uh, digital marketing, you know, with very narrow focus. Uh, for example, like Facebook will allow you to micro target people and see whether you're like spot on audience, how would they respond, right? Would they be uh, very interested? Even they are not interested, then probably, you know, it's not a um, good fit. And you have time to experiment other things. You know, you, you came up with one idea in the first place. I'm sure you have many more ideas you want to test. But if you spend, like if you linger on one idea you know, that has like bad signs, like it doesn't, you know, the market signals you that it may not work out, but you just ignore and just keep on doing it. You are losing opportunities to try out other things. You only live once, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Kenji, feel free to uh, include your links in the chat, uh, whether it's your LinkedIn or East Meets uh, East or anything else um, that you want sure. to share and have people uh, reach out to. Um, once Kenji puts those links in, feel free to check them out. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Is there and anything you. you wanna uh, say before we get to Marlena? No, I'm, I'm very excited about Marlena's session, so yeah. <laughs> Awesome. All righty. Thank you. Um, and feel free to keep the questions coming, you guys, because, um, you know, usually, I mean, I like the way we did it because it was kind of like interactive and like more feedback from the group. Uh, but usually we have questions rolling up until the end. So if anybody has more questions for Kenji, uh, we will get to them later for sure. Sure. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much. Soprana, thank you, everyone. Welcome, Marlena. Marlena, I'm going to have you introduce yourself and tell us more about your education tech uh, a, a, a app. It's an app, right? We'll see what the future We'll holds. see. Okay. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I'm like what Kenji said. I need to um, do some testing and some validation to see what this is going to be built into. <laughs> Listen to but, the market. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, we'll see what the market says. Hand. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm really great um, to be in this space too, because um, I'm a first time founder, which might be the same for a lot of people. And when I share my experience, they're so relatable and they are understanding and we learn from each other. So go right into that. So I am a first time founder in ed tech space, and I am one of the founders in the Why Accelerate 2021 cohort. So excited for that. Um, so what am I doing here? So. A little bit before I came into women in AI, most of my background has been in software project management and that software development space, supply chain manufacturing, um, very technical, <laughs> leading teams from all around the world, um, which is very fun sometimes if you understand the life of a project manager. Um, but being a project manager and consultant, I get to work in many industries and work with many people and dynamics and just grow in that aspect. I work with some of the biggest brands like Medtronic, 
e-commerce, Google, Allianz, Target, it's been really exciting. Um, but um, like some people who start entrepreneurship, it took one layoff due to restructure to say, nope, uh -uh, nope, not me. We're not doing this for 20 years. We're not working in corporate America. And I was ready to start my journey. And it's been like a two year journey stuck in the idea stage until I came across women in AI and accelerator program that was willing to help me get out of that idea stage. And now I'm happy to say that I have a solution called Pipe Dream Technologies, uh, which is an ed tech company providing learners with a pipeline to fulfilling a meaningful career through inclusive personalized education. So essentially, what we're doing is we're developing an immersive platform that will help high school students start their careers in tech by providing hands-on experience through experiential learning with industry experts as mentors, um, including building employable, stackable skills to advance their careers post-graduation. That's a lot to unpack. I mean, to unpack. <laughs> That's a lot to impact there, but we'll get a chance to talk about that um, in a bit. Well, and I love it because, um, first of all, as um, an upskiller, you know, because I, I mean, I had done my my bachelor's and, and you know, I, I went like the traditional route as far as education. But then when I was when I was thinking about getting involved with machine learning and AI and data science, I was like, well, first of all, there aren't that many master. I mean, now there are more, but there weren't as many master's programs. And what you find out is like when you go the traditional route, um, you know, they might not teach you Python. And then you go out into the, the the real world trying to get a job and everyone's like, Python, Python, Python. And you're like, well, that wasn't even part of my curriculum. So now you have to learn new stuff, you know? So I really love uh, that you're doing, that you're focusing more on high schoolers because they're already in the situation where all they're doing is learning, right? So why not have personalized education so that they can get a sense of like what they actually like and not just the traditional, you know, it's like if you know you want a career in tech, great. Like, let's start teaching you all the languages. Let's start teaching you about product, about marketing, about all the different parts that impact working in tech. You know, um, so I just love it because as from a self discovery perspective, like it, it seems perfect. Um, you're, you're hitting it right on. I yeah. call it my solution like the try before you buy it career. <laughs> and it really, it really made perfect sense because when you look at where we at now with education, I'm quite sure we, everyone can agree that the current education system it's setting us up for failures. And I'm quite sure a lot of people like me, they graduate high school and college and you're like, man, college did not prepare me for this. <laughs> and we're essentially trying to, we're, we're trying to flip the script here to say that why go to college to be 40K in debt to get a job for 40K when you can be a high school student earning 40K at entry level paying for your college degree. And if you need to get a bachelor's, um, the company's paying for that. If you want me to advance, pay for my education. And that's what we're trying to get to um, when I think about it. <laughs> and when you say try before you buy, like that's literally the point of high school. It's like, I mean, unless you have, unless you go to private school or whatever, yeah. but like that's literally the point of public school. It's try before you buy. Like you try out all the different you know, subjects, and then you pay for your college education. Like that's at least how it's been in the yeah. US. Um, uh, so, you know, like I, I really love what you're doing in this space because, you know, as you know, like we need to kind of revamp our education system so that it's actually meeting these kids, like where they're interested in being. And we can't get away from tech. Like it's just going to be more and more of a focus as the years go by. So why not meet them where they are and show them around? Mm -hmm. And that's actually what, as I was doing my research and building a solution, that actually what fueled my energy and my passion for wanting to get more and more involved with tech. And I live in a city and we live in a world, 2021, where like tech is the future. We need more tech skills. We need to do this. And the focus has always been like talent, talent, talent. We need to hire talent. Oh, we know what? We need to put STEM in education. We need these kids to learn skill as early as elementary school. 
And I'm like in this meeting, it's like, oh, we're in the twilight zone here. Like the kids are still learning about their identity, their culture differences. And we're trying to train them up to learn technology so they can work for a company. And if they're a BIPOC person might not be accepted. Like we need to do a time out here. Like, yes, technology isn't going anywhere. It is our future. And there's big social economic issues happening, especially for BIPIC where there's a big digital divide. But before we can do technology, we need to talk about humans. And I'm so happy in the talk before me, we were talking about society and cultures and why we're so focused, like how can they learn skills so they can get an entry level job. I was more focused on, you know what, you guys focus on tech. I'm gonna start on building leadership skills and people who will eventually lead your company and lead the, all these products. Because it's very important that when we have technology, your technology is only as good as the people who's building it. And if we're building our future leaders, we need to teach them early about morals, about ethics, about accessibility and to be these thoughtful servant leaders so that if they get into a job, life is not telling them that they need to think this way, that they need to do things this way. And we think about profit, profit, profit. Yes, you have to answer this to someone, but you have to influence where the world is going because what is so scary to me of coming down a pipeline, yes, I love technology, I'm an enthusiast, is that it's the people who's controlling it. It's the people who's rushing to be the first. Forget about the implementation, the implications that it will have on the underrepresented groups, the bias, the algorithm. They don't care. Mm -hmm. You have companies that say we do DNI, but do they really care about that to really make sure that their employees are are following that? So we really have to take a root um, area at it. Like we have to train them early and say when you go out there to solve problems. You have to think of it from a sustainable um, standpoint. So we're teaching sustainability and best practices. And when we're talking about education, it's going, not education, technology, it's going to change. It's going to always be changed. Today is AI, tomorrow might be IA, I don't know, it's something. <laughs> so we want to prepare the leaders to already adopt sustainability mindset change and really influence where the direction going, because if not, it looks scary. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, we've had events. Um, we had a public policy person. We had uh, Merv from the Coded Bias documentary. She was in one of the, oh God, what was, it was another Y event. I, maybe it was related to Hackathon. I, I don't exactly remember. Or maybe it was another Y Accelerate event. Um, but we've had people that work in public policy in, in law. They, they talk about the laws and, you know, by and large, the consensus is that no matter what happens, the tech is moving too fast for the laws to catch up. So really, the, the last line of defense, basically, is the culture. There has to be just a culture shift. You know, the, the consumers, we ourselves, basically, uh, have to demand certain norms from the corporations. And it's, it's already happening to some degree. But I mean, I would argue it, it's not happening enough. So it's really nice that, you know, by creating this like educational platform, uh, this platform that's helping, you know, the young people, the people that are still in high school and, and by kind of instilling those norms, you know, cause I, I kind of see it like, we're still like sort of like early adopters of this, you know, like AI big data hasn't been around that long. So like, it's kind of like right now that we're like learning how like this can like hurt us in like really tangible ways. Cause in addition to not having legislation to protect us, um, you know, we're, we're like literally finding out like how it's hurting us. Like we still don't really know, like people are still writing books that other people are shocked by today, you know? So we're still not at the point where this is like known. Um, so I think it's really, really clever that you're, that you're looking to, um, you know, instill certain norms in with the young people because mm -hmm. they are going to take what we have now and like, really like fine tune it and find ways to live with it. Mm -hmm. You hit such on a good point too. Our society, I don't know if it's just the U.S., maybe other, other countries too. We live in a world where it's treat versus prevent. We see what's coming down the pipeline. <laughs> we see what's happening. 
but we're not doing anything about it until it's happened. Like going to a hospital, like a doctor can pay you where you don't get sick, but they make more money because you're sick. Same thing with whole obesity epidemic. And like in schools, we teach about health and nutrition, but yeah, we have a vending machine to get a Kit Kat bar for 50 cents. And when you look at um, our low, our poverty communities, we have a corner store. I'm from Memphis, so I'm from the hood. We have like corner stores that sell all this stuff at dirt cheap prices where there's that access. But yet we're having all these panels and discussions about nutrition and obesity. So applying that to education, we're quick to identify the problem, but we're not putting rooted solution to help fix it and be problem solvers, which I think is most important when we talk about critical thinking and changing our culture and mindset that we need to prevent first and treat later. What well, prevents so you don't have to treat um, in that aspect. So that's how I look at it. Uh, you know, the thing is we don't live in a vacuum. So if you look at Europe versus the US or even Europe versus China, right? Because China, China's, as a country, their ethos towards AI, because they've said, we're going to be global leader in AI by 2030. Like, they've said that. Like, that is the mandate. And it is a mandate. Like, it is it is um, a, a strategic, tactical program. Um, their decision has been, as a society, as a, as a culture, they, they have said, uh, by 2030, we're going to lead the world in this. They've already implemented AI in ways we in the U.S. have not, and um, you know their their sensibility is that we are not going to prioritize personal data to the benefit of this wider um, engagement. Europe has basically taken the opposite stance, where they're saying we understand this is a part of life. We are going to protect personal liberties as much as we possibly can. I mean. You know, in Germany, you can't write anything about, uh, you know, Nazis or uh, nationalistic uh, thoughts. Like their AIs pick it up right away, and then they, you know, you can't have a profile without your actual name. Like they need to know who you are, and your representation online is you. And uh, you know, if you if you pass certain thresholds, like they will reach out to you. Um, but with that said, they're still going to protect your uh, liberties. So GDPR and all this other stuff that they've done, um, and they're still continuing to do. Like there are still uh, data privacy laws that they're rolling out in Europe. Um, so they are much, much more strict than we are in the US. Um, and, you know, so the, the thing is like the US is kind of like in this like middle ground, right? Where you have to see who's funding who. So if Facebook gets a slap on the wrist for taking advantage of people's personal data and they're making tons of money because all those ads, targeted ads that they're selling because they have all this data on us, right? So like they're making tons of money, who is going to step in and say, no, no, Facebook, don't you make that much money? Like maybe Apple, <laughs> but like other than that, like no one really, you know? So it very much uh, is still up for debate. Yeah, absolutely. You hit a, a good point about funding. And that's the sad part when it comes to our country and to education, that there's no doubt that America could be the first. Our education, our nutrition, what's happening, all of that is so political. We overcomplicated such a simple system, all because we're profit driven. Um, it's like with tech world, we're in a rush to be the first. Like I remember, I forgot what it was that Apple did. But they patent something that they haven't, that probably might take years to build, but because they was in a rush to be first and to sell. And that's hurting us. And we say we don't really put the focus back on the user. Uh, we know that education is not where it needs to be. But when I look at these different companies who are becoming unicorns or who are doing these things, I look at how they're benefiting the people, but yet, when you look at people like us who are underrepresented, who are women, who know the struggles and issues, it's still a problem. And like, I remember talking to a friend and I was like, I'm, look, I'm, I'm a founder, I'm trying to get an ad tech, I'm trying to do this. So like, I don't care what unicorn business you have out there. If it's not helping black people, if it's not giving us infrastructure, if I can't access it, it doesn't matter to me because right. I have a whole 
other system going on that people are not thinking about and then we're getting left behind. Like with TikTok, um, you had a big movement where they're like, why should I create on this platform if all you're gonna do is steal it and give it to other creators? And I'm not creating wealth for myself, but they are. And we still have this whole big wealth mm -hmm. gap. But like you said, with like the whole dating thing that Asian men and black women are the least desirable. Like we're so quick to put up statistics and say the problem, but what have you done to change that? Or why is that? Right. So we live in this upside down world where we have the ability to change it, but we refuse to do it because we're so focused on who's feeding us and how we're getting advantage, which is why when I take it, I literally told myself like, you know what? I didn't give hope. I didn't give up hope on companies and everyone else to get it right. So I rather focus on what matters. And we say our children are our future. I rather be the person that really trained them up in ethics, who trained them up in sustainabilities and really trained them up to really understand how to be social entrepreneurs and how to learn. And what I like about my solution, because I come from a project management background and they might not know what career, I'm teaching them the skills early of whatever that you choose to go to, that you're learning how to be a problem solver, how to challenge the status quo, how to ask those questions and whatever it is that you desire to be, you have that path going forward because literally even as an entrepreneur, we don't have guidance. We don't have structure. We just look at how they did it. And maybe that can apply to me too. And you have all these gurus and prophets <laughs> all on social media I'll tell you that how you should live your life because what? They really don't know how to live their life. So mm -hmm. it's important. <laughs> Well, and look at the education system. I mean, for God's sakes, like they're still teaching the same things that they were teaching back when like everyone worked in factories. I mean, it's not like the industrial revolution anymore. Like, okay, we're learning like more advanced math and like more advanced sciences, but like, you know, I wouldn't say that we've seen like the rehaul that I would expect to see, um, you know, as the waves of the fourth industrial revolution are crashing, you know, on our shores. Like this is not where I thought we would be in the era of having AI and machine learning to the to the capacity that we have it right now. Um, you know, the fact that our our uh, you know higher institutions can't keep up with teaching the skills, people have to go to boot camp to learn. Uh, you know, things that they couldn't even start to learn, you know, five years ago, because it was the PhD that was learning how to do that. You know, I, I'm expecting a whole lot more from from our education system these days. Absolutely. And that's speaking as the wife of a, of a teacher, you know. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, one thing I really liked when I looked at, I did my research, Holland IQ. Uh, what I saw, what I really admire about like other countries like China, why in India, why they got so much, mm -hmm. um, so many unicorns and they're doing it so well, it's because they value education. They see it as the light. That's a culture thing. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> like we got the doors of the church yeah. open right there. <laughs> <laughs> you are so right. When I deal with people from other countries, there is such a level of respect, you know, with me being a teacher that I don't get from the average American person. It's like their whole, t their whole t tone just changes, you know? And, and I just find that very interesting. Absolutely. So what I do like about America and democracy is that how I really see, how I really see the education is that if our government don't get it together, I don't really see a lot of people enrolling in public school. There's going to be a streamlined online education that's um, accessible to all, giving them what they need. And they're literally enrolling in a whole nother program, unless the government say, uh -uh, we're not making money. They need to come to public schools. But that's really how I said, it. it's going to take people not enrolling in um, the governments and they need to learn from colleges because colleges are saying that, why would me as a Gen Z, why would I go to college and be in debt and have a career that I hate. Like I see people complaining on Twitter all the time. Why would I waste my time doing that when I can be an entrepreneur through Instagram, through TikTok, 
that's the reason for that. If a kid in India who is like nine years old is making billions, I'm going to figure out how I can make a billion on YouTube too. I don't know how, but teach me the ways, sir. <laughs> so not They're not wrong for that, right? I mean, they're not. not at all. Just like with corporate America and a lot of people who were laid off and who's experienced, which is why I'm so passionate about ed tech and career direction. Like it's starting first with high school students, but we have to think about the learners who like me in project management, where it says, I'm starting to question my career because I'm not in an environment that I think is fulfilling to me. So it's like, how do I really find that path or being a career if it's corporate America how do I know it's the culture that's more effective and more inclusive? And how do I find that path like and get the mentorships to do that? So there's a really, I'm really putting a focus back on us as people. Like companies are gonna make profit, whatever. But like Amazon, we have to be obsessed with customers and we have to put it back on the students because this is who the focus was on, but somehow down the lines, the internet came along and everything else happened that we just swiped it away from students. And they, and I know George Bush did no child left behind, but we got left behind and dumped at this yes, point. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, so. we did. And then also there's such a huge teacher shortage. My school system hired 600 brand new teachers and we still have like 400 openings. And it's gotten worse with the pandemic because so many teachers are like, you know what? I'm not doing this anymore. Right. And it was almost going to be me, but I, I'm just going to do one more year. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's a, that's a red flag. You know, like our teachers, I didn't realize it when I did my research in my Facebook alone that I had so many friends who are teachers. And so I was in for popcorn every day, how they were complaining, how they're stressed. And we, yes. I really do think a teacher is underrated and the pay that they get other than for 10 years, you get your student loans pay always a good perk. I really feel for it. And I really do see a future like this whole, everyone wants to be a course influencer. Everyone wants to have their own marketplace. I really do see teachers going to a platform where they can still teach and be the past, do the passion they love just through another area. And that's scary because going back to the students, we are still needing that guidance and the direction in our life. And those K through 12, it's those most precious years. And if you're thinking about the environment that they in, they need this safe space to grow yes. and to be leaders. And we're talking about a population that is growing massively by 2030. And so it's, it, it breaks my heart. Um, when I did the initial interviews, like I was literally lost. Like, I don't even know where to go at this point. I didn't know ed tech was this huge of a mess. Um, but we have to start somewhere. And I think even though my solution problem might not be ready to 2023, I'm like an apple in the world. We're always late with the technology but we deploy it late because it's the best out there and people are gonna know that whatever I deliver is perfect because at the end of the day, I'm focused on the life of the student and how they would grow in their lifelong. And we're thinking about teachers, so yeah. <laughs> well, and we'll see where we are in three years because there might be new improvements that you can then add to your product. So that's exactly. really- <laughs> Um, And then the last thing I will say is uh, I used to work at Tesla, so I, I I used to think all the time about Elon, so mixed feelings about that. But, you know, I would think about like, he would say, okay, in the future, like, and more companies are doing this, they're hiring people that just have a high school education, because as long as you have the right skills for the job you want to do, it shouldn't matter if you went to a liberal arts education and learned history or English or whatever, right? So um, I think that's gonna be like the, the, the trend is like, uh, you know, learn about the things you're, you're interested in, get enough exposure so that you make a good, you know, educated choice about what you're interested in and then find a way to do that without completely indebting yourself in indentured servitude when you first start your professional career at 18 or 20. Yeah. I mean, right? Like the fact that kids have all this debt and they still don't really know if it's what they wanna do. They've just been told you have to go to college and get all this debt just, just for the pleasure of working. I mean, it's not yeah. sustainable, it's not. It's not. You have, I was very fortunate to be one of those people who did what I need to do outside of the classroom to have a job offer. Mm -hmm. 
But think of all those people who don't even have that, or who's not even working in their field, who's doing something completely different. And when yeah, they it's ask like 50 me, fifty million of them, it's like fifty yeah. million people. Yeah, but I always told them that I tell them like, even though I'm on a salary and I work for a company, the fact that they're not working in corporate America, they're already ahead of so many people because we're stuck in a rat race. Even though you're not getting paid right now, you can literally just figure out what your passion is and turn that into a profitable um, company or business and just really follow your pursuit. So yeah, <laughs> I'm excited for what I have coming up. Me too. Me too. Um, well, I'm proud of you young people. Don't wait till you're almost 60 like me to just dive in. <laughs> so, but it's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. Wow, look at us. We're a minute over. This was a really good session. I feel like we just started. <laughs> I know. There's so much. When it's, yeah, I'm sorry, Mila. Marlena, I just want to say go for it. I have been in education for like 20 some years. I left schools for a while just to be in industry and look at how the workforce is so keep doing that we really need it our, our students especially high school they need to see the meaning of what they're learning and how it is applied in their okay. future careers so really really so happy for you <laughs> thank you snaps snaps all around thank you so much marlena thank you so much kenji I know we haven't heard from Kenji in a little bit, but I'm sure she loved it. She was really excited about your talk. So thank you both so much. This was such an excellent session. And um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think this is a good way for us to end um, our, our events. So we'll see you guys in September. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Uh -huh. Bye. Bye.